Okay, let's check out a problem pertaining to heating and cooling curves. So this says the cooling curve above shows how the temperature of a sample varies with time as the sample goes through phase changes. The sample starts as a gas and heat is removed at a constant rate. At which time does the sample contain the most liquid? So this is a great question because it is really just asking us if we know how to read uh, this kind of a diagram. So um, we've got some, some sections that have a slope to them, and then we have some horizontal sections. So what we need to remember is that these sloped sections are within one particular phase, and the temperature is changing within that phase. And then the horizontal sections are phase changes, where the temperature does not change. See how for the horizontal section, temperature does not change, but there is energy being exchanged with, from the system and its surroundings, and that is the phase change. Right, because it's either vaporizing or condensing or melting or freezing. And so there's a, there's a change in the in, in, uh, intermolecular forces. So uh, that's why the temperature does not change, although energy is exchanged. So let's just remember that for this section, it's, it's gas and it's cooling. Right, The temperature is going down. And we're going forward in, forward in time and the temperature is going down. Right, Then right here... This is the gas condensing. The temperature does not change, but it is, it is going from the gas to liquid phase. So what's important to understand is that from the left of this dot until this dot, it is entirely gas. And then by the time we get to this dot, it is entirely liquid. So from here, from this dot to this dot, we are going from gas to liquid, right? Then right here, the liquid is cooling. And then right here, this section, this is freezing, right? So at this dot, right? So here we got to all liquid and then here it's cooling, cooling, cooling. So here at this point, it's still all liquid, but then all over the course of this uh, horizontal line here, it's going from liquid to solid. Now at this dot, it is all solid. It has finished freezing, it's now frozen. Uh, and so, and then lastly, this is the solid that is cooling even further, right? We're going, we're going lower. So this is the, this is the melting or freezing point of this liquid, this is the boiling, or uh, this is the boiling point of the liquid, but we're cooling. And so we have to be able to see that. If we look at a heating and cooling curve, we have to know, okay, when we have a slope, uh, that's, that, is a, that, is a, that is the substance within a particular phase that is changing temperature. And the slope of that line depends on the specific heat of that substance in that phase. Right, so the gas is cooling. Then these horizontal lines, that is the phase change. These are, two, these are the two phase changes. So we have to know that. Now, back to the question, at which time does the sample contain the most liquid? Okay, so T1, that's all gas. That, that's definitely not it. T5, that's all solid, right? Or, or it's actually, no, it's, 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 a, a, it's almost entirely solid. It's, al it's not quite there, but it is almost all solid. So let's look at two, three, and four. So uh, two, from two to three to four, we, this here, this section here, it's condensing. So we have some gas and some liquid. Now, so it's not two because we have just begun, we have just begun condensing. Uh, T3 has more liquid than T2, right? But it's still not all the way liquid. It's, there's still some gas in there. There's a little bit of room left. So let's compare with T4. They gave you, the, gave you T4 after this little slant in case we were confused as to what this represented. But remember, this is just the cooling of the liquid, right? So it is remaining in the liquid phase over this section. It is just getting cooler. Uh, and so at T4, we do still have all liquid. It is about to begin freezing but it has not begun yet. So it's still completely liquid. Whereas with T3, we have mostly liquid, but still some gas. So this is going to be T4. So this is a great question for testing your knowledge of heating and cooling curves. What do these lines represent? At which position are we in? Which phase and how much of it? And uh, this is just a great problem. Okay, so here's a problem uh, dealing with heats of formation. 
So this says, given the data in the table below, we want the, the standard change in enthalpy for this reaction. So we have IF7 gas plus I2 gas yields IF5 gas plus 2 IF gas. Uh, and we have some data here. Naturally, we need some tabulated data with heats of formation. Uh, so remember, we're going to take the sum of the heats of formation of the products and subtract from that the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants. Now, <clears throat> The thing is, we're going to need a heat of formation for any substance that is not an element in its standard state, right? Because we know that uh, the heat of formation uh, of any element in its, uh, in its most stable state at, uh, at STP is going to be zero. So here we have IF, so there's that. We have IF5 and we have IF7. Now, here's the tricky thing about this problem. I'd say most people would look at this and go, I2, that's an element, we're good, right? We don't need that. So we're going to add up 1 times negative 840 and 2 times negative 95. There's your product. Subtract from that negative 941, and there's going to be our answer. And, of course, we do have that, that answer available among the options. But remember the standard state aspect, right? And not just an element, but an element in its, in its most stable state, uh, in uh, 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 at STP. So we're talking about phase. We're talking about the allotrope, right? If carbon was diamond, that's not the same as being graphite. If we're talking about O3, that's not the same as O2. Even though those are elements, right? We're talking. It, it, it matters uh, what phase they're in and and uh, and the uh, uh, and everything else. So I2 is actually a solid at room temperature. So I2 gas. We're going to need a heat of formation here uh, for I2 gas. Now, the heat of formation uh, would happen to just be the heat of sublimation. We'd be talking about the enthalpy associated with going from the solid phase to the gas phase, and that is the heat of sublimation. Uh, <clears throat> however, that is a non-zero value, and because that is not listed here, we actually cannot do this calculation. So a lot, of, a lot of times the E is going to be kind of a trick answer, but in this case it's not. The heat of formation of I2 gas is needed for the calculation. We have to do products minus reactants, and this is not zero. If this said I2 solid, then that would be zero, and we'd be good to go. But it said I2 gas, that is not its most stable state, uh, and so we would need that heat of sublimation. So that's a quick one, a little bit of a tricky one if we're not careful. So just a reminder to look at phases and, and every aspect, all, all of the information given to you. But that's one on heats of formation. Okay, we have another problem on heats of formation. So given the data in the table below, we want the standard change in enthalpy for the reaction. And we have these, uh, this is the reaction here. And we do have a heat of formation, a standard heat of formation for all four of these substances. None of these are elements, they are all compounds. So we will need a heat of formation for all of these. Now we do have all the information that we need. So we can go ahead and calculate uh, the delta H here. And so this is going to be, we have to add up the heats of formation for the products. So we have this compound right here. That's going to be negative two, three, four, six. Uh, and then we're going to add to that two times uh, for water. We're given water right here, negative 285.9. And we're going to subtract from that the sum of the heats of formation for the reactant. So we have calcium hydroxide, negative 986.6, plus this, there's two. Remember, we have to keep in mind the stoichiometric coefficients. So we are going to have to put those stoichiometric coefficients in there. Uh, because if we are forming uh, two moles versus one mole of something, that's going to change the uh, enthalpy associated with that. Now, if we plug this into the calculator, we want to be very careful. You can do a few different things. You can either get one value. You can, you can simplify each value one at a time, uh, or you can put everything into the calculator all at once, but make sure you use brackets precisely the way I've shown here, right? Because we need this entire value minus this entire quantity a uh, very common source of errors to put minus and then this and then plus without brackets 
well, that is, is actually adding something rather than subtracting because we're subtracting the sum. So this negative sign would distribute. So just be careful with your arithmetic and your uh, calculator entries. But this does end up being negative uh, 130.4. That is going to be negative uh, 130.4 kilojoules. That is option B. So that is a very straightforward question on heats of formation. Okay, here's a problem on Hess's law. We want to calculate the standard change in enthalpy for reaction three. This one here, uh, where sulfur dioxide is oxidized to sulfur trioxide. 2SO2 plus O2 yields 2SO3. And this is the information we're given. So remember with Hess's law, what we're going to do is take uh, reactions with known uh, changes in enthalpy, and we're going to manipulate them algebraically uh, in order to add them up to, to yield the uh, reaction we want to know something about. And if we manipulate the delta H's in the same way and add those together, we will get the delta H uh, for the reaction we want because, uh, because enthalpy is a state function. So what do we need to do? We need to take these and add them together in some way to give this. So let's take the first one. We have 2S. Uh, we, we're, we're, we want to recognize that 2SO3 is a product there, and 2SO3 is a product here. So that looks good. We can actually take this first one exactly as it is uh, and get 2SO3. And that is going to be negative 790 kilojoules. Now let's look at the second one. The second one does not look ready to go. We have to do some stuff to it. So what do we notice? Well, O2 and O2, that looks good, but that's not going to work still because we have SO2 right here as a product and we have 2SO2 as a reactant right here. O2, you see, we have another O2 in the first one, so it looks like we're going to be able to cancel out or manipulate O2 in some way with that. But SO2 is only showing up here and here. It's a product here. It has to be a reactant and we need two of them. So we're going to have to invert this reaction and double it. We're going to have to flip this and double it. So let's get uh, SO2 is now going to be a reactant and let's say 2SO2 and then that is going to yield 2S and 2O2. Now what will the delta H be? When we invert the reaction we have to invert the sign. So 297, negative 297 becomes positive 297. But we also doubled everything, so we have to double the delta H. So positive 297 becomes positive 594 kilojoules. <clears throat> now we are ready to add them together and cancel some stuff out. We've got 2S and 2S. Those go away. We have 302 and 202, so just like a 3x and a 2x kind of a thing, we can get rid of two of them. So to get rid of two of them, we just get 102, and then we'll get rid of all of those. So 202 is gone, and then two of them gone here leaves just one left. And so if we add that all together, we get 2SO2 plus O2 yields 2SO3. And if we add these up, negative 790 plus 594, we get negative 196 kilojoules. So that one is going to be A. So with Hess's law, again, we're just taking the, uh, the, thermo, the thermochemical equations that were given, and we just need to combine them in some way to get the reaction in question. We can invert them. We can flip them uh, to the, uh, going the other way from products to reactants in which case you invert the sign on the delta H and you can double, triple, cut in half, whatever you want to do to the coefficients. You have to just do the same thing to the delta H. Cut it in half, double it, whatever it is. Add them, to, uh, add them together to get your reaction. Add, to get, add together the delta H's and that will give you the delta H for the reaction in question. So that's a quick one on Hess's law. Okay, we have two quick ones on specific heat. So this says the specific heat of liquid bromine is 0.226 joules per gram Kelvin. How much heat in joules is required to raise the temperature of 10 milliliters of bromine from 25 to 27.3 Celsius? And we're given the density of liquid bromine as 3.12 grams per milliliter. So we have some amount of bromine and it has a specific heat. And we want to know how much heat is required to raise the temperature 
by this amount. So let's go ahead and start with the specific heat. And let's do this like this. Now, so this is the specific heat. We're going to want an answer in joules, so we have to cancel out grams and Kelvin by putting the grams we have and the Kelvin that represents the, 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 the interval, the temperature change, right? So we don't have a mass, but we have milliliters, but that's fine. Let's just go ahead and put that in there, 10 milliliters, because what can we also do? We can multiply by the density, so 3.12 grams per milliliter. Then we have to get the, uh, the change in temperature. So we need the delta T. And so 25 to 27.3, 27.3 minus 25, that leaves us with 2.3 uh, Kelvin. So uh, the, the di when we have Celsius and Kelvin, one degree Celsius is one Kelvin. The magnitude is the same. It's just where it starts. So 2.3 degrees Celsius is 2.3 Kelvin. That's the same thing. Um, and so the reason we're setting it up this way is, look at that, we have milliliters, milliliters, grams, grams, Kelvin, Kelvin. And so the great thing about doing dimensional analysis this way or answering questions with this component of dimensional analysis is that if the units work out to give you what you want, you almost certainly did it right. So everything cancels out except joules. We're going to get our answer in joules, and that is going to be 16.2 joules. So that one was A. So this was very straightforward. The only extra thing was having to use the density to convert uh, a volume into grams. But other than that, it was the same. And then the second one, the specific heat capacity of methane gas is 2.2 joules per gram Kelvin. How many joules of heat are needed to raise the temperature of 5 grams of methane from 36 to 75 Celsius? So this one is even more straightforward. We just have exactly what we need. So 2.2 uh, joules per gram Kelvin. If we multiply by the grams and by the Kelvin temperature change, we'll get an answer in joules. And so we're just going to multiply by 5 grams of methane, and then we're going to multiply by, this is uh, 39 Kelvin. This is 39 Kelvin from 36 to 75. And so we can very clearly see that grams cancel out and Kelvin cancel out. And so this works. If it takes this many joules per gram, if it's this many joules, to raise uh, the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree, then you have to multiply by the number of grams you have and the number of degrees, that is the temperature change that you're trying to achieve. So multiply by the grams, multiply by the temperature change, and we do end up with 429. That one is going to be C. And so these are two very straightforward uh, problems on specific heat, just making sure you remember the definition and how to calculate uh, some things using specific heat.